How's everybody doing? All right. So we're continuing our series in the book of Acts. And today, our big picture is we're going to be talking about a healing church, a healing church. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now, you have handouts in your pews, okay? Let's take a look at those, all right? These are your notes. This is going to be notes for today. You could take this home with you. You can write on it. You could do whatever you'd like with it, okay? Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. All right. I think you could bring up the verse. If you can't read it there, just follow along, okay? Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple area for the 3 o'clock hour of prayer. And a certain man, lame, from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms or money from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered a temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. All right, bring up the next slide. Thank you. Now, you just take a look at it because we kind of read this already. I want you to take a look at it, all right? Here's the scene. Peter and John, two of the most prominent apostles in the early church, were going to the Jerusalem, to the Jewish temple. Sorry, not Jerusalem temple. Well, it's in Jerusalem. Jewish temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to pray. Prayers were offered in the temple, if you don't know this, three times a day, 9 in the morning, at noon, and at 3 p.m. And at this time, we need to understand, Jewish Christians were not pushed out of Judaism by non-Christian Jews. In other words, Peter and John, along with the rest of the Jewish believers, were still considered to be Jews in good standing with the larger Jewish community, not necessarily the religious leaders. As they're approaching, though, they see a lame man. I want you to take some of this into, into your mind now. They see a lame man outside the gate, which was called beautiful. Now, this is probably, historically, this is probably the gate that the historian Josephus said was covered over with silver and gold. It was about 75 feet high, and it was the main eastern entrance to the court of the Gentiles. Now, I want you to notice something, guys. This is important here. Notice, and you have to keep it as we're going to go through the message today. The lame man is outside the temple or the temple courts, not inside. Apart, listen to me, apart from the Jewish community. Basically, he is an outcast, but Jesus is about to change all of that. Amen? Praise God. God's so good. It was once said, the church serves more as a hospital than anything. It's a place for the wounded, broken, and sick to meet the great physician. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you as you empower me, and I thank you as you help me to convey this message this morning with the authority and unction of your Holy Spirit. Hallowed be your name, Lord. 
that, God, your message would go forth with life in the name of Jesus. Amen. To be a healing church. Now, when we speak of the church, who are we talking about? A church? Who? Us, right? We're talking about us, right? The body of Christ. To be a healing church, there are, like college, there are requisites and there are prerequisites. Now, you have to follow along the story because if you don't know this, Luke, of all the writers of the New Testament, Luke is the most detailed. And his writing is not just for you and I to learn something. It's for you and I to follow something, to pick up something that we should see as he writes his gospel. Now, all the writers did that, but Luke is very particular. Okay, slide four. Three requisites. Three prerequisites for a healing church. Three prerequisites. Now, you know, guys, right, prerequisites become, come before the requisites, right? So it's like, it's like a dinner, right? You get the salad. The salad is the intro where the soup is, and then the meal is going to come, right? So that's what Luke is trying to build up to. He's trying to paint a picture. He's trying to show us something. Look at the verse here. Now, Peter and John... We're going up to the temple area for the 3 o'clock hour of prayer. First prerequisite for a healing church. A healing church is primarily, listen to that, primarily, write it down in the notes, primarily a church of prayer. This was true of the early church. This was not a one and done. This was the life that they lived. John and Peter are on their way to the temple to pray. But I'm going to step back for a second. Guys, I'm going to tell you something truthful, which is a little sad. Prayer is the most neglected area of the Christian life. And if it is on the list at all, it's at the bottom. It's not a good sign. It's not a good sign. Yet, the church grew the most when they pray together, folks, it's right here. When you read this Bible and when you read the Acts of the Apostles, when those guys got together and prayed together, let me tell you something. Something happened. Something happened. Because listen to me. I'm going to digress a little bit. When you pray, you know what's happening? You're stepping back and you're allowing God to step in. See, if we don't pray... What place does God have to do his stuff? And if God's not doing it, guess what? It ain't going to get done the best way. It's human effort, a lot of it. Okay, first prerequisite. A healing church is primarily what? A church of prayer. Next slide. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Remember, I told you, Luke is very, very detailed. Peter looked straight at him as did John. What can you observe here? Come on, what can you observe here? There you go. Notice that verse. Peter looked straight at him as did John. You see... They are working in unison, a team. You see, John is ready to respond. John is working with. John is in step with Peter. And likewise, Peter is in step with John. Question, guys. So as a prerequisite for a second here, the second prerequisite is what a healing church works together, a team. Question, my friends, do you have someone you are partnering with? Do you? Do you want to grow in Christ? Do you really want to grow in Christ? You will not grow in Christ until you find somebody to walk with, pray with, and share your heart with. It's not just a spouse. You will not grow until you find somebody to pray with, to walk this out, walk with God, with somebody, and to share your heart with. 
Notice when you look at the Acts of the Apostles, for the most part, they are together in teams of two, and then they get back together. There's no such thing as solo Christianity, really. The success of the early church, it starts right here. John and Peter are doing this walk with God together. And this is how the church had the most impact. Now, don't gloss over this because in America, we are very individualistic driven because of our whole thing of free enterprise and capitalism. I'm not downing it. I'm trying to paint a picture. Our individualism creates isolationism. That's not the New Testament. You don't hide yourself in a cave and pray. You come together with the body, with others. You pray, you seek God together, and then you see God move because God is a triune God. So we should be together, should we not? We should be praying together. We should seek seeking God together. We should be walking this out together. So first prereq prerequisite, uh, what? A healing church is a church of prayer. Second prerequisite is what? A healing church is one that works together, that has someone that you are walking with, working with, praying with, seeking God together. Notice how Luke is giving us the prerequisites before the requisites. These are keys. This is not just theology or understanding. This is practical. This is practice. This is the way we need to function and live in the body of Christ. Okay, bring up the next slide. Notice this. Peter says, what? Look at us, not look at me. Third prerequisite, a healing church glorifies Christ and not themselves. A healing church glorifies Christ and not themselves. You guys, you got this on your notes. Look at the purity of their love for God and each other. Look at it. Look. Look at it. Neither, think about this, neither takes any credit for the healing. Neither is anybody trying to build up their own ministry, their own walk with God. And by the way, even later on at the end of the story, Peter tells the crowd, it is Jesus' name and the faith that through him that has completely healed this man or the lame man. Peter deflects all the glory away from himself and points to Christ. He never draws attention to himself. He never says, John, this is my thing, not your thing. No, this is our thing. When you walk with God, when you follow these prerequisites, God could begin to do something new. But you've got to take that initiative. You've got to take that step. If you don't have inclusiveness in your Christianity, you need to study it. Okay, so these are the primary ingredients for the next three we're going to discuss, the actual requisites themselves. To be a healing church, let's begin to tackle the requisites, the requisites. Okay, first, there must be God's activity. And you're going to see this clearly. I'm going to show you some things here. There must be God's activity. Bring up the next slide. Yeah, thanks, guys. And fixing his eyes on him with John. Notice that again. Look how Luke writes this out. With John, Peter said, look at us. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, and I'm going to take a step back for a second. What I do have, the question is, are you given, are you given what you do have? Don't tell me you don't have nothing because that's not God. God's not a God of nothing. God's a God of everything. He's a God of something. The Bible says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you, we are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Are you taking, are you giving 
I shouldn't even say taking. Are you given what God has given you? But what I do have, I give you. I give you. In the name of what? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Folks, that name makes something happen. Rise up and walk. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. The power for healing came from God. Somebody says, I know, that's obvious, but listen to me. The inner promptings, the inner promptings, we're going to get to this, Stop Peter dead in his tracks on that day to reach out to the man. Now, you have to stop for a second, gang. Remember, as we read earlier, the lame man was what? Carried how often to the temple? Daily. Now, what did John and Peter do daily? Right? Each day. Right? More than likely, more than likely, Peter and John saw this man and passed by him a number of times. Now, the first thing you have to say, what made the difference? What happened? What did I say? First, there must be God's activity, right? There must be God's activity. Remember the prereqs, though, right? Prayer, working together, glorifying Christ. You've got to do those things. If you don't do those things, you're not on the road to success. You've got to pray. You've got to make sure that you're going to work together. You're partnering with people. You're praying. You're seeking God together, not solo, together. Watch the success. It keeps going. It keeps snowballing. You have to be ready. And in all things, you're going to glorify Christ, not what you're doing, not your ministry, anything like that. Whatever God's giving you to do, you're going to glorify Christ. You're going to be very inclusive. Now there's God's activity. You see? You see the pattern? Because of the prereqs, now there's God's activity. God's got something to work with. He's got something to begin to move on, right? So what happened? What's the difference here? They pass by him every day. But this day, there is a divine interruption, a divine prompting, a divine impulse the divine promptings, the encounter and flow through Peter at the moment. Let's get a clearer picture or let's clear the picture. I'm going to step back again. I told you something. God is always doing something. Let's read it. John 5, 17. This is what Jesus is telling a group of people. But he answered, Jesus answered them, listen, Get this big picture, guys. My father has been working until now. And I have been working. He is simply telling you and I and his audience, God is always working. He is always up to something. He is always doing something. God does not take a rest. Somebody says, yes, he did on the Sabbath. That's a lie because children are born on the Sabbath. Children are conceived on the Sabbath. People are saved on the Sabbath. God is always working. He never takes a break. Now, the point is our part as a healing church means if God is, look, we did the prerequisite, right? Now we have God's activity. What's the requisite? What's our part? What? Look for it. You see what Peter did? Peter's going up, right? He's doing all the prereqs, right? He's doing all the prereqs. But now this day, there is a divine interruption that stops him dead in his tracks because Jesus wants to make this man well. And if you think about the grand picture of the story, it's through this event, not through the preaching, it's through this event coupled with the preaching that 5,000 come to Christ. You understand what God's doing here? There's an activity, and Peter is ready to look for it. He's ready to look for it. John and Peter are looking for it. Okay. Let me keep going for a second. A word of caution, guys. A word of caution. Bring up the next slide. 
If we get caught up in the why, and this is what we do. This is our American culture, man. We are terrible in this way. We get caught up in the why. Why is God doing it this way? Why is God doing it that way? One, if you get caught up in that, you will not see what God is doing. Two, you will not act on what God is doing. You get caught up in the why. Notice Peter never asks why. He steps into what God is doing. John 5, 19. Peter said the son could do nothing of himself, but only what he sees the father doing. Not why the father is doing something, because God is always working. I am to step into what God is doing. When you ask why, you and I dwell on the whys, and I include myself. Guess what? We will not see what God is doing. We will not act on what God is doing. And you know what's sad in that picture is that lives are left. Lives are, you know, lives go by the wayside. We miss that opportunity. It's not good. It's not healthy. So, look for those lives that need Christ's love, power, and healing. We always want to be look. Look for it. Look for it, guys. God's activity. Look for it. I'm going to digress. I'm going to give you guys a personal challenge right now. Bring up that next verse. For he says, now, when, now, when, now is the time of God's favor. When, now is the day of salvation. Why? God's always working. God's always working. This is important. If you want a relationship with the God of the Bible, if you want a healing from the God of the Bible, never say to yourself, if it didn't happen yesterday, then it will never happen. God is always working. He's at work now. Rely totally on what his son Jesus did on the cross. And keep in mind, the word salvation has a word group to it in the actual original language. And one of them is... It also means to make well, heal, restore to health. Okay, first, there must be what? God's activity. Second, there must be human availability. Bring up that slide. You got it? Cool, thank you. I'm only going to read verse 7. And he, meaning Peter, took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. One commentator once said, the power for this healing was Christ, but the hands were Peter, or the hand was Peter. Folks, our human availability must embrace the nature of a healing church. To catch this, let's keep Peter in the back of our mind. Next slide. For we are what? God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Now listen to me. This is the truth. God could have healed this man without Peter. But that's not God's way. It's not God's way. The all-knowing, the all Powerful, the all-wise God doesn't want to work around us or in spite of us or even apart from us. Glory be to God, he wants to work through us. God, through his Holy Spirit, works together with us toward meeting the needs of the hurting, the lost, the broken, the wounded, the sick. Praise God. What do you think this whole series is about? You see, what's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? What is it? To do nothing more and nothing less, but completely do what? What Jesus already begun to do. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Don't try to analyze it. Don't try to get, build a dissertation about it. If you can figure out God, you're not walking, walking by faith. If you can, well, this just makes sense, this doesn't make sense, I can go through, we can go through dozens and dozens of things in the Bible. Why were people healed by Peter's shadow? Why were the others healed by a handkerchief by Paul? So I don't know. Does it matter? Let's step in what God is doing. Let's not try to figure out why God's doing it. Amen? Do you want to gain ground or you want to stand still? I want to gain ground. The kingdom of God is always moving forward. God's always working. Okay, here's the deal, guys. Our part, what? What is it? Respond to it. If you look for it, then you got to begin to what? 
respond to it. Respond to it. Peter was available to God. Availability to God simply means that we believe in and we allow for divine interruptions. Peter simply responded. That's all he did. He didn't take credit. He didn't, you know, build a whole entire, like, treasure chest over. He didn't get on Charisma Magazine. He didn't call up the New York Times. He simply responded to it. And if we respond, if we respond, the lives of others will never be the same. This man's life was never the same. And listen to me. I repeated, I said this before, I repeat it again. This one event, this one event moves Peter to share the gospel. And 5,000 outside of children and women, 5,000 come to Christ. It can't happen any other way. Somebody said it was the preaching of the gospel. No, it was not. The trigger was the power of God healing this man. What about the 3,000 before? Still the power of God. There was an outpouring on the day of Pentecost. It says there was a mighty rushing wind. There's a lot of other things that unfolded there. You know, you know, the power of God was the drawing power. Okay, first, there must be what? God's activity. Second, there must be human availability. Our first one, our part is to look for it. Second one, our part is to respond to it. Now, third, there must be God's complete working. Sometimes you and I cut God short. We cut him short. Well, God, you're done here. He is? That's, he's done? Really? He's done? Why? Because our experience dictates it? Why? Because that's our understanding of where we're at biblically? God's done? Okay, let's look at this. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Other translations will say temple. Notice the healing of the man in the story. Notice it, guys. He wasn't expecting it. He wasn't even asking for it. He wanted some cash. And God zangs him. It's a brand new word. I said I just put an English dictionary. God zangs him. He gives him back his legs. You talk about a deposit. You talk about an investment. However, let's stop, guys. Let's take a look at the complete working of God. I want you to hold in your mind Ephesians 3.20, which says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we what? Or, or think. God gives him back his legs, yet God goes beyond the actual healing. Think about it, folks. He's outside the temple. He's an outcast. When he's healed, he goes into the temple. He's given back to the community. You understand what we're going, where we're going with this? You see, the healing is awesome. The healing is terrific. But each day, he's sitting outside the temple. And then now we read here in verse 8, he's going into the temple. This is the ultimate of what healing, a healing church entails. The healing of the whole person. Listen to me. Understand this. We don't want to take back because we're a church that believes in the power and healing of Christ. Physical healing. As well as any other and every other type of healing. Healing is not just relieving pain. It involves healing memories. Healing relationships. Regaining hope and purpose, among other things. Do you understand? If you and I, if we see God's activity and we look for it, if you and I have human availability and we respond to it, that's great. But if you and I don't allow the complete working of God, which somebody's going to still miss out on something, all that God has for us. Do you want that? I don't. I want to see God give everything that he has for everybody. I want to see God give that person or those people all that he desires to give them. 
And sometimes it's not just what we think or what our appearance or what we see. So here's our part. Our part is what? To fill it. To fill it. Is the band still here? I'm going to call you out. Or if you're not doing the last song, I don't know. It's up to you. But today, Christ is reaching out to you. The first thing, Christ is reaching out to you. Are you today ready to turn your life over to Jesus Christ? It's time. Don't be delay. He's reaching out to you today. And when the band is done with their song, whatever you're going to sing, afterwards there are going to be people up here to pray for you. We're going to dismiss you, but if you want to stay for prayer afterward, you could. And this is a question I have for some of you. Are you available for God to use you? Do you want to give what God's given you to others? Do you want to share what God's given you? Finally, these are questions. Answer yourself in the pew as the last song goes. Are you allowing for divine interruptions in your life? Can I just add? One thing here. The Bible, Jesus says this in the 10th chapter of John. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Listen. Don't believe in fairy tales and fables. God speaks. He's still alive. He still sits on the throne. And he lives inside of me and you. Are you allowing God to speak to you? that God could stop you on a dime and say, I want you to reach out to this person, that person, this one, or that one. Are you allowing divine interruptions?